choir sang that song the very first time I preached a sermon. And it was my prayer then, and it remains my prayer today. God, if you can use anything, you can use me. Pray with me now. God, thank you for this opportunity that you give me to be used. And so, God, open up my mouth, and may your words come forth. Thank you, God, that you'll use anybody to spread your word of hope and love in the world. So use us today, God. Open us up to receive all that you would have for us. And God, may we trust that you have chosen us to be instruments in this world. Thank you in advance for how your spirit's going to move. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We've been journeying this uh, Easter season throughout the early church witness to discover how God continued to move people and to partner with God to do God's work in the world. We began with Thomas as he moved from, from fear to faith and how Peter moved from fishing to feeding God's children and how the eunuch moved from confusion to confession after the early church moved from needy to nourished. You know, the disciples, like we talked about last week, they had begun spreading the news. And, and because of the persecution there in Jerusalem, God's word was getting out further and further away. And so today, we understand how Saul is going to move from murder to mission. You see, he was concerned about that message that was going out. And so he decided that he would go up to Damascus and that he would stop God's word from being spread. He got, he got, he got um, an ability to go. He got papers that allowed him to go up to Damascus and, and arrest anybody that was following the way and to bring them bound back to Jerusalem. You see, he was bound by the law. And he was so concerned about people following these 636 laws of God that he was so bound up that he couldn't see beyond it. But you can't blame a man for his conviction. Now, can you? He wanted to protect that which he found valuable, sadly, at the expense of others. Now, we don't blame a man who would protect his home and his family from an intruder. We would not blame a woman for protecting her babies. We would admire them for standing up for that which they thought was right. The difference is sometimes what I think is right is different than what you think is right. And then who's right, right? And it gets confusing, doesn't it? But Saul was a man of conviction. And Saul is on his way to do what he just knew was the right thing to do. Until Jesus showed up on his road to Damascus. You know, there are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ who have done what they felt convicted to do. And in fact, they've blamed many of the earth's tragedies on sometimes our community. Some of them hold placards that claim God hates those whom God has created. I can't even show that slide. It's not even worth using to see it again. But you know what I'm talking about. And they protest funerals. And God hates everybody but them. And how sad a God that they serve. And then there are others who um, blamed Hurricane Bonnie in 1998. Uh, Pat Robertson had preemptively blamed Gay Days. Of all things, here in Disney World, they blamed Gay Days weekend for being the cause of this pending storm. However, when the storm approached the U.S. mainland, it missed Florida altogether. <laughs> in the hardest hit areas, one of the hardest hit areas was in Hampton Roads, Virginia, where Robertson 700 Club was based. <clears throat> Be careful where you uh, uh, assume God's going to uh, attack for your own benefit. And then Jerry Falwell, God rest his soul, he, he blamed 9-11. On many things, including the pagans, the abortionists, the feminists, the gays, and lesbians who are actively trying to make an alternative lifestyle. The ACLU, the people of the American way, and all of those who have tried to secularize America. He said, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped make this happen. Seriously? That was Osama bin Laden, as far as I know. And yet, 
they ain't talk about Islamic terrorism, but they're going to talk about Islamic terrorism at the hate crime that happened across the street. But I guess it happened to gays, so they didn't have to blame the gays for that one, I reckon, right? But I digress. Then uh, uh, um, I get all off track. And then um, uh, two different people, the dude Michael Marke Markovich, uh, who is the um, person who uh, was part of the Repent America, he blamed... Uh, the Hurricane Katrina on uh, New Orleans annual gay party, Southern Decadence. He, those who know a lot about I don't even know that that happened, but he knows about the gay decadence, Southern Decadence party that happens in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> and then a year later, John Hagee, the dude in um, uh, San Antonio, he blamed a Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans because it had that gay pride parade the week before. God bless them. But they had their convictions, right? And they assumed that they were speaking God's word. But then Jesus will show up in places that you unexpect. Jesus showed up on Saul's way to Damascus. And a light came and it was so bright that it blinded him. Jesus is the light of the world. And this light blinds Saul and he falls on the ground. And then he hears a voice with no one there saying, Saul... Why are you persecuting me? And Saul knows enough to say, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, It's me who you are persecuting. And then he tells him, Get up and go to Damascus. And there I will send for someone for you. And then Jesus shows up to Ananias. A disciple of the Lord. And he goes to Ananias and says, there's a dude coming named Saul. And he says, I say what? No, no, thank you. I would rather not have to do all that. He's the one that's coming to condemn all of us. And Jesus said, he's the one whom I've chosen to be an instrument to bring forth the good news to the Gentiles. We would not know about this had Paul not been saved, right? To the Gentiles and to the other people of Israel and to kings, God will use anybody to give God's message of word, uh, his word of hope and love in the world. And so Ananias goes as God instructed. And when he lays his hands on Saul, when he said, go to the, to the street called Straight, I don't know about you, but I find that quite funny. <laughs> go to the street called straight and he finds his way there and when he touched and laid hands on Saul scales fell from his eyes and he was able to see in a brand new way you know I believe God showed up on Thursday night Amen. at Northland Church <laughs> And I believe that scales fell off some people's eyes in that moment. And I was amazed. I kept sitting up there. And I kept looking at Dr. Hunter. And I kept looking at the bishop. And I'm thinking, how in God's name am I here? How is this possible that we're having a discussion? The first affirming discussion likely in that room ever. Right? And I believe, because of the testimony of changed lives of gay people, that scales fell off people's eyes that night. And they heard for the first time a message of inclusion and a message of love for all of God's children, even those of us who identify as LGBTQI and all of our allies that were there. I was so proud to look out and see an entire section of people from joy. An entire section of people that were willing to show just how incredible and ex expansive God's love is. How incredible that we had a message that we could share with them and they were willing to hear it. Do you realize Dr. Hunter took a huge risk? A huge, it's going to cost him dearly to take the risk that he took, but I'm grateful for somebody 
who follows the call of God. And sadly, it always comes from the midst of tragedy. But because of Pulse, and because he understood that everything was going to change, he's willing to at least have a conversation about changing. And I'm thankful and I'm grateful for his witness and his willingness to do so. How incredible. Do you realize after that service, I walked to the edge and then I got down off the altar and several people came to me. And do you realize one of the people that came to shake my hand was Alan Chambers, Exodus. And he came and he said, let's have a conversation. And I said, I would love to. I was clueless. He's been in Winter Park all this time. I had no idea. He lives here. And we will have a conversation. Saints, things can change if we're willing to be instruments of God's hope and God's peace. But it requires we put our necks out. It requires that we show God's love. And then if God can use anybody, God can use a southern short. <laughs> Though I'm mad about that part. <laughs> Lesbian preacher. <laughs> to offer a message of hope to people that may not have heard it yet. I want to be an Ananias. I want to be that one that will go to the people nobody else wants to go to and lay hands on them and watch the scales fall from their eyes. Right? We have an opportunity. We have an incredible opportunity to be instruments of peace, not of hate, but instruments of love and peace. Like St. Francis of Assisi said, where there Make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, he said, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I want to be that instrument that God will use here and all over the world. I want to be a source of information for people. A way out for some people. A way out of bondage to be, for chains to be loosed. I want God to use me. I want God to use joy. Joy has an incredible opportunity to be seen as a beacon of hope and light. And it is my joy to serve as its pastor as we continue to take the doors off the church and take the church to the streets. We are instruments, saints, of peace and love. May it be so in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.